What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And my guest today is Tomi Gomori. Tomi is associate professor at the College of Social Work at Florida State University. He teaches and researches on mental health and homelessness. His recent book is called Mad Science, Psychiatric Coercion, Diagnosis, and Drugs, co-authored with Stuart Kirk and David Cohen. Tomi, I want to welcome you to Madness Radio. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for uh, inviting me. I really am inspired by your your new book, Mad Science. I recommend people check it out. It's a wealth of information about the history of psychiatry, as well as the the sort of the dilemmas that we're in around failed treatments, and especially the the role that psychiatry has come to play of being this coercive uh, force, social control force that we're going to be talking about on the show today and how we can maybe develop some alternatives to that or at least new ways of thinking about that. But maybe we should start out by just telling us about how you got interested in this field and how you came to have perspectives that are very different than the mainstream of uh, mental health professionals. I happen to be a refugee. As a young boy, I came out of Hungary, which was then uh, under communist control in 1956. And so I came into the States essentially an alien, uh, literally. I couldn't speak the language, so everything was brand new. And of course, I had to begin to learn all about what it was to be an American. My parents were uh, went through the Holocaust, so that uh, my family's background uh, in some ways obviously impacted me uh, in terms of my views about power, authority, coercion, and that sort of thing. I had a number of careers before I became a uh, professor, and one of them uh, was uh, in retail business. And at some point, I became uh, very, very uncomfortable with being in that business. I felt uh, somewhat at a loss, and uh, someone suggested that I go uh, and talk to someone, a therapist. If you know anything about Eastern Europe, it wasn't the thing to do. You know, you sort of dealt with your issues like a man. And so it was a little alienating, but uh, what I did is uh, actually uh, get involved in what is now not the most popular, but for me it was a wonderful experience, what was called deep psychoanalytic work. I spent seven years doing that. Now, was this a Freudian psychoanalysis? Yes. This was like multiple sessions a week and lots of free association. and It wasn't a formal, I wasn't on a couch, but uh, yes, it was deep in the sense that it was multiple sessions per week. It was a uh, exploration of my past and my uh, uh, experiences. I wouldn't say that it was, uh, you know, completely traditional, but it was uh, a wonderfully... Uh, powerful experience for me. What I came to realize, uh, which is where I am currently, is I don't like the term therapy. Again, it's a medical phrase. What I like better is education. My seven years were the best education I ever received about myself. And uh, I think that idea of education removes a lot of the uh, magic PR, whatever it is, uh, and the medical expectations. Uh, and it makes it easier for a person to engage, I think, seeing it as, as an educational process rather than some, you know, something's wrong with me and as a consequence I need to do this. But anyway, so, so that kind of, uh, and that process led me to uh, sell my business and go back to get a master's in social work because I said, gee, I want to do this. There was a course of psychopathology. I went to NYU for my master's degree as well. And uh, while I was at a placement, it was an inpatient setting, and the clinical director looked at us, uh, you know, fresh uh, interns who had never seen anyone who's supposed to be crazy, uh, said, well, just remember, schizophrenics are not like you. They often have bad odor and an egg shape. And 
I was, I thought it was funny. I, I thought she was trying to be humorous. And she uh, let me know very quickly that she was serious. And so I was totally confused and scared out of my mind. And eggs shaped like their bodies were shaped like eggs? Overweight, bad odor, uh, that sort of thing. I was totally frightened because I, I've just been told that these are not people like me. I was very, very uncomfortable until uh, in psychopathology there was an article called The Myth of Mental Illness by Tom Soss that was assigned. And when I read that, like a light went on and I began to understand some of the issues that I need to be exploring. But it made me, of course, very, very critical of everything that I was experiencing. Do you think that your um, experience as an immigrant from Hungary and coming out of that background of communist rule and the, the Holocaust with your family, do you think that that sensitized you to the misuse of power and the way that ideology operates that Thomas Saz talks about in the, the myth of mental illness? Oh, absolutely. Uh, some people may know Tom uh, Sass is a Hungarian himself. He was about a generation or two ahead of me in terms of his age. I resonated to the control and the uh, power that was exerted by the psychiatric establishment that I was uh, working within. Yeah, a lot of us have remarked that uh, the contemporary mental health system does have a kind of uh, authoritarian, monolithic side to it, kind of Kafkaesque bureaucracy that maybe I've, could be reminiscent of communist Eastern Bloc country rule in some ways. Well, of course, often psychiatrists critique, you know, the psychiatry of uh, the Soviet Union as if it was, you know, the bad guy and look how good we are here. But I would argue fundamentally without the coercive authority that psychiatry is uniquely granted, you know, in medicine, it would be a very different kind of practice. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because um, people hear that phrase, the myth of mental illness, and it's very provocative, because clearly something is, is going on with people. But let's talk about these ideas that contemporary science is promoting, that there are physical brain dysfunctions going on on, an, on a physiological and neurological level, and that's what's behind mental illness, the idea that there are genetic differences, that some people have different genes, and therefore they're more likely to be um, mentally ill. Tell us what your view is of that mainstream scientific understanding of, of so-called mental illness. To use a fairly simplistic model of argument that Tom uh, simply argued, uh, he also felt that Obviously, the behaviors were very real, and the problems and the experiences were very real. What he meant by the myth, of course, was that, in his judgment, these were not diseases of the brain or uh, medical organic problems. And his simple argument was that if you have a brain disease, that's a neurological disease. That's a very clear area of medicine that has its own uh, separate field of practice. And of course, the best example was uh, what used to be called general paralysis of the insane, uh, which was the mental disorder label. And then when they found out that it was neurosyphilis caused by a particular little germ, then it became a uh, neurological disorder easily treated by penicillin, for example. And there's a long history of this. This is not, nothing that's not acknowledged in the field. The original asylums mixed in all kinds of different people, some who had dementia or had syphilis or in infections of the brain or had developmental disorders, all of which would now be kind of separated out into different uh, realms of medical category. And that was something that was done to me when I was in psychiatric uh, hospitalization is that they did a lot of tests that were ruling out that there was something organic, that I had a brain injury or I had some kind of yes. something going on that was physical and identifiable because then it would have gone into a different department. And instead, they put me in the psychiatric category because they couldn't find anything that would c come under the purview of neurology. Let's remember that, uh, as you suggest, in the original insane asylums, there were all sorts of people not necessarily in terms of health issues, but, you know, there were criminals, there were elderly folks who had no place, no one wanted to take care of them. You had all the unwanted thrown into this prison, really. That's what these were, uh, locked wards, you know, I mean, that's what that is. 
And the problem was that when people like Emil Kreplin did their sort of efforts to describe, uh, you know, schizophrenia, which he called dementia praecox and separated from uh, manic depression, is that he had this locked up group of folks. This wasn't the way you identify real disease in the world. Here, people like Kreplin had a, uh, an audience of folks and that they were looking for craziness. You know, in, in other words, they were looking for the behaviors that would make it a mental illness. So those original categorizations that come out of that asylum mix of everybody being thrown in together, that essentially is the categories that we still have in the DSM. Uh, Kreplin has been acknowledged as the original diagnostician, you know, in terms of these categories. So when you go in and get a diagnosis, a mental illness diagnosis, they're not looking at blood samples, they're not doing MRIs, they're not looking at physiological markers or differences in any ways. But what about the um, claim that's made that there are genetic differences, that certain genes or genetic expression um, are present among people with schizophrenia that aren't present among people with bipolar or depression that aren't present with people who don't have it? And, and the evidence for that would be like identical twin studies and the sort of the genetic research, we've kind of been really told that, look, there is this genetic component or genetic predisposition. Just because you have folks who share genes, for example, identical twins versus fraternal twins versus uh, cousins and that sort of thing, the explanation is at least as valid that it is the environment in which the folks have grown up that is the causal explanation. In other words, identical twins are treated much, much more the same way than fraternal twins, for example. And uh, siblings who are, you know, some years apart, even more dramatically different. What about the studies that claim when identical twins are separated at birth? I think that actually in those studies, there actually are a lot of common environmental factors that aren't acknowledged in the studies because really the researchers are on kind of a quest to demonstrate this genetic causality. And some of that research does go back to the eugenics era when there was a very strong racist and um, bigotry element in the science itself because of the eugenics movement. We're, we're not that far away uh, from uh, this uh, notion of, uh, of eugenics, in other words, controlling folks who are really not up to par. And if they are up to par, can we make them even better than par? In other words, this biological uh, control is being promoted right now. Uh, we don't call it that. It's, you know, we call it a cognitive enhancement, for example. Uh, science some months ago came up with an article arguing that Ritalin may be the new drug of choice for normal folks who want cognitive enhancement. Now, this is the drug that was purported to be necessary for ADHD correction. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about medications then, because if we're setting aside the belief that mental illnesses are biological and genetic and caused by an, an abnormal physiology or brain chemistry, then what happens to our theory about and use of uh, medications as treatments? I think what's important uh, that I would like to make sure is clear is that we have no replicated studies that demonstrate physiological genetic issues targeting any particular mental disorder. We don't have any physiological markers for any mental disorder, zero. And we've been doing this research, even if we just count the DSM era from the 1980s. We are always being told by psychiatric science that it's around the corner, but we don't have anything, not a single mental disorder with a lesion. Sometimes some psychiatrists, I think in a manipulative way, claim that, well, the only Mental disorders that might have uh, lesions are dementias, but this is not right. They're, those are neurological disorders. And now we have linked neurology to psychiatry by people style themselves as neuropsychiatrists. So by the play of language, rather than science, we are being deceptive how we are dealing with 
individuals who are trying to understand these issues. Yeah, if you look closely at the media articles that come out and the scientific breakthrough studies that are published, what they tend to show is correlations or studies that haven't been reproduced yet or conjecture or the possibility this suggests some role further study is needed. And it's really a sense that the belief comes before the evidence, that there's a belief that, it, like you said, it's right around the corner. We're going to track this down. We're going to find it if we just keep researching. And that's actually not good science. If you've gone in one avenue and you haven't come up with solid evidence, you need to start exploring other avenues. That is a, an enormous problem. Now, in terms of drugs, we call them medication. When we want to think positively of them, we call them drugs, I suppose, if we don't want to be so. But these are just uh, psychoactive chemicals. And I would argue that there are only two types of psychiatric psychoactive chemicals, uppers and downers. The antidepressants and Ritalin, you know, which is a, an upper or a speed, similar action as uh, cocaine, for example, as I understand it, Ritalin, uh, I don't know if it still is, but it used to be the leading black market drug for uh, some of the Ivy League schools for study. Adderall, I think, may have passed that distinction. But... You know, I, I come from the uh, 60s drug generation where, you know, there was a, a different view uh, about the use of drugs and uh, people uh, routinely took speed in order to study, in order to lose weight, in order to you know be able to stay up and talk. And so it's not mysterious to anyone who's looked at the uh, research to find that, according to the, uh, the feds, they've studied Ritalin in normal kids as well as in uh, so-called ADHD diagnosed kids. And the outcomes are identical. The behavioral changes are identical. In other words, it's not ADHD specific. It's, uh, you know, any, anyone taking these drugs will have very similar behavioral responses. I think that's important to note because as psychoactive substances, they will affect everybody. It's not just um, the presence of a disease or the presence of psychosis means that the drug is going to have an effect on you. No, these will have stimulating or um, sedating effects for anybody that takes them. In fact, some of the same medications that are used in psychiatric contexts are also used in veterinary medicine for calming down animals. So so none of this is really to be necessarily anti-medication or anti-drug. It's just to say, look, we have to be much more honest about, you know, what the drugs are and what they're doing and how they can be useful. And then And then people sometimes say, well, you know, I don't feel high when I take my psychiatric medication. I feel like it just calms me and stabilizes me and makes me feel normal. And that's true, That, but that's also one of the things about substances. People who are taking coffee every day, for example, can feel normal and stabilized by their regular coffee intake. And if you actually go back into the history of psychiatry, Sigmund Freud was um, a user of cocaine, and he wrote about its therapeutic and beneficial properties, and he described its effect as as making him feel no more normal. He wasn't using cocaine to get high. He was using it to feel more normal. So I think it can be very useful to understand the medications and psychiatric drugs as psychoactive substances without sort of throwing them into a simplistic framework of they just get you high, but think about them in a more complicated way about how psychoactives are already in our lives and how they do affect our consciousness along with certain kinds of risks that go along with them. Absolutely. Well, and the important thing to remember is that human beings have always used psychoactives for a variety of reasons. And so, so drug usage is part of being a human being. And if you look at the incredible volume of vitamins, of over-the-counter drugs, prescription drugs that are being used, it's just a tribute to the fact that we in America love drugs. It's just that we love certain drugs at certain times and not at other times, uh, and they revolve. All the drugs that are illegal at one point were highly effective medications, and now they're coming back, you know? Medical marijuana, now legal marijuana. So I'm not against drugs at all. I, uh, the problem in terms of psychiatric drugs is that the adverse effects, which are mislabeled side effects to suggest that they're not as bad as, you know, as, as they may be, adverse effects are not honestly disclosed by most psychiatrists. Even though they're black labeled, meaning that they are the heaviest warnings about potential problems that the FDA can put on, for example, antidepressants, psychiatrists themselves and organizations where the psychiatric services are offered 
rarely disclosed fully. The negative effects are. That's a very, very serious issue. And I think also if there is an acknowledgement of the negative effects, there's this message which is, look, psychosis is so serious, it's so severe that you've got to get on some medication because if you don't, the psychosis is like a wildfire. It's like a fever or an infection that's just going rampant in your brain and an untreated mental illness will then become damaging to your brain. What do you think about that uh, message that's often put out there? Well, that's a fear tactic. Psychosis is not infectious in the sense that an infectious disease like tuberculosis is, but we use the metaphor of something like an infectious disease to scare people. If you're clear that psychosis, this is very essentially very frightening behavior, sometimes to people who are observing it and often to the people who are experiencing the mood states and their inability to, to gather themselves around all these frightening feelings that they have. But remember, these are your thoughts, these are your experiences, they don't come from the outside and infest you. And that's very, very important to remember that it is an individual, a thinking, living human being who is experiencing all of those things within themselves. One of the big jobs of a therapy or education, as I prefer to call it, is to begin to give a person who feels totally out of control a sense that they do have control over things like their so-called racing thoughts and their, their sense that they're going to jump off the roof. So those are very important things to begin to work on. I think that's a really good point. This is something that comes up a lot in my own work with people that really what I'm dealing with is isolation and powerlessness. And it's about making a connection and it's about getting the person into a place where they feel like they have some control in their lives. And if there is anything to the idea that untreated psychosis is harmful, it's just from the basic reality that when people don't get help, it makes things worse. Suffering that isn't responded to can make things worse, but there isn't uh, infection or some disease process that's going on in your brain that somehow medications or antipsychotics is going to protect you from. That's just not how medications work, and it's not consistent with anything that's been discovered about research into mental disorders and mental illness. This medical model concept is used for other things like you know the cycle of violence. These are all seen as spreadable diseases. And we, t you know, the public health model, which of course came from having infectious diseases, you know, at the turn of the 20th century and where that model worked very well. It's being applied to a lot of the, the social work is one of those prof professions that takes the public health model uh, very, very seriously. I think it's a misapplication of a once useful model for some entirely different set of social problems. And, and I think th this metaphor is so powerful and uh, the medical profession is so impacting that it's uncritically uh, assumed uh, to be useful beyond its very limited uh, field. You mentioned before the Saz's book, The Myth of Mental Illness, and it's important that we point out that the myth part isn't that something is going on. Clearly something is going on. The myth part is the scientific medicalization and investment into the power of, of psychiatry, some sense of understanding of, of, of why that's going on. But there is something going on. And you use the word that I think is very interesting in the book, which is misbehavior, that something happens, people seem to go into you could call it an altered state of consciousness. You could call it a shift from the personality that we ordinarily associate with them. And then they start to do things that seem misbehaving, that they are talking about killing themselves, that they are no longer going to work, that they are so disorganized and confusing that they're staying up all night and they're causing disruptions and they're getting into arguments or they're acting strange or some kind of disturbance that's affecting the other people around them to an extreme degree to the point where people start to really go into very stressful states trying to take care of the person, trying to look after them. They get very worried about the person. Now, this behavior is real. And so if we're going to engage with that, if we're going to respond to it in a humane and compassionate way, but we're not going to use the medicalization framework, then how do we engage with that? What are some ideas 
for how to respond to that because so quickly we reach for coercion that we say, okay, the psychiatrists are sort of playing the alternate police role. We don't want so-and-so to just wander the streets because we need to get some sleep and we need to kick them out of our house and they're going to cause trouble by wandering into somebody else's house or we want to actually you know, get them under the control of somebody who's going to take care of them. And so we bring in the ER, we bring in the psychiatrist, we get them into the whole mental health medical framework. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. My guest today is Tony Gamori. He's associate professor at the College of Social Work at Florida State University. He teaches and researches on mental health and homelessness, and his recent book is Mad Science, Psychiatric Coercion, Diagnosis, and Drugs, co-authored with Stuart Kirk and David Cohen. What are some other ways of thinking about that, and what are some alternative ways that we can engage with people? Such a question is doesn't have a simple solution because why why people misbehave is individualized and so there's no generic response to what causes people to begin to uh, act strangely whatever that might mean let's say you're a young person and you suddenly uh, someone wants to think of you as potentially a schizophrenic whatever that might mean there are many reasons why young people may be frightened. One of the biggest reasons is that they are moving from adolescence to potential adulthood. And if you look at the schizophrenia, many, many folks get diagnosed at that late adolescent, early adulthood stage. And one might consider, of course, uh, you have to be open-minded here and not just presume schizophrenia means something, you know, medical, is that this transition, not everyone is up for it. Becoming an adult, a responsible adult, is not an easy transition. And of course, we're, in our society currently, it's not a very, very responsible society. In fact, now authorities do almost everything for parents, for example, right? If you have a problem in school, you have some social worker who comes in and handles it, not the parent, for example. Parents have been taught in our society, I believe, gee, I, you know, I, I just can't do this part of parenting, and so we need an expert. And so the more you give people the sense that they are not capable, the more they are likely to pass it off to the social service providers, you know, the government-funded social welfare providers, that I think that this changing sense of responsibility among parents, for example, does contribute to the problem between parents and children and the dynamics that can create really troubled young people. People have a tough time with employment opportunities, jobs, economically stabilizing themselves. So there's a social welfare component that I think promotes the, 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 the ambiguity of trying to create a life for someone. You know, the homeless issue, for example, uh, often is connected to mental health issues. But one never knows, the argument is the classic argument, what came first, the craziness or the poverty and the homelessness. In other words, circumstantial opportunities or lack of them can cause what we would categorize as psychosis, in my judgment. Do you want to say more about the homelessness piece to it? I work with uh, the homeless here in uh, Tallahassee. Uh, I'm on the board of the emergency shelter here. Uh, I run a weekly group with residents of the shelter. And, and what is so very interesting is that uh, people who are considered to be you know, weird and strange and psychotic and crazy can come into this group and talk coherently. I could understand them. And that was very reminiscent of when my that clinical director in, in that first placement uh, when I was at NYU many years ago said, you can't talk to these people because they're not like you. Well, what was so weird for me and what scared me was that when they weren't medicated or not too medicated, they made perfect sense to me. And so I started thinking before knowing all, all the things that I know now that maybe I'm crazy because I understood them. In the old days, I, I don't know if this is still the case, uh, psychiatrists used to warn uh, their interns not to listen to severely and persistently mentally ill because it's verbal salad. It is just a symptom like a runny nose. Their words don't mean anything. In other words, disregard your client. 
don't listen to them because they're crazy. And so it's like, you know, a runny nose. That's all. The words mean nothing. And of course, that's exactly the opposite of what I think is essential. Absolutely. Anybody who's in any kind of distress, the isolation is so much a part of it and making a connection. And the way you make the way you make a connection with people is feeling listened to and understood. And so not only is that the opposite of what we should be doing, but it actually creates craziness because it instructs the experts to treat the person as if they have nothing to say. And if you encounter people that are responding to you that you have nothing meaningful to say, that's going to start to affect you dramatically. You will start to doubt yourself. You will become more and more isolated. And so the relationship gets created as a crazy making relationship by this attitude that, oh, the, the stuff the person is talking about is just a symptom of a broken brain, or it's just part of their mental illness and you shouldn't indulge it or exacerbate it or make it worse by actually paying attention to it. In terms of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is the way we identify the people that we think are mentally ill, that manual, if unscientific, would mean that we are using invalid categorical labels for what I would best call problems, perhaps severe problems in living. And the fact happens to be that they are unreliable and invalid, as admitted to, not by, you know, an arch critic like Gomori, but by the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, Dr. Insel. Just before the DSM-5 came out in May, on his blog, his NIMH blog, admitted that they will no longer be using the DSM categories to pursue their research. Well, what an admission that is. Now, of course, you wonder what the heck they will be using. Uh, they're, they have some uh, putative uh, options that they're going to be pursuing. The point I'm trying to make is that in order to do research on mental illness, well, like with anything else, you have to have a sample of individuals to do the research on. And so if you have invalid categories of schizophrenics, meaning that they are all perhaps heterogeneous, which is the fact, if you look at the literature, well, then we're not able to actually make any statements about treating schizophrenics as a group because we can't get them. There's no, no way for us to identify discrete groups of schizophrenics or discrete groups of uh, major depressive disorder folks. This is a deep, deep problem in, in the research in psychiatry that no one discusses. You see the problem. We, we can't make arguments for treatments, for use of medication on discrete populations of so-called mentally ill when we don't have a way of directly identifying them. All we can do is get major behavioral observations. And, you know, so if you're acting out, they'll put you in that category. If we need to look at cancer patients, you know, pancreatic cancer, we have a way of identifying that group. One of the complications of not seeing what are described as mental illnesses as biological and, and, and medical is the whole question of, of disability and working and not working and how society decides who's qualified to receive benefits. I mean, I've been on disability and it was very, very difficult for me to work. I wasn't able to, I mean, I tried, I would just go in and I would be completely overpowered by simple social interactions or being in public or different things that are going on in my head or different fears or different traumas that I'm struggling with. And so I wasn't able to, to work even though I wanted to desperately. And so that designation that this person is disabled that that was really helpful to me to be able to get that disability check. So what, what do we do if these are problems in living, or if these are people who are terrified, if these are people who are overwhelmed, and, but not people who are suffering from a biological illness? How do we then support people when they're not able to work the way that other people are? And how do we, how do we categorize that or how do we make that decision about disability? Well, this is a question of how do we help our fellow citizens. Homeless people are not all crazy and diagnosed and, and receive, you know, subsidized housing. 
So I don't see this as a major problem. If our society deems that certain troubling experiences of people are validly to be supported by the society, we have enough money to do that. I object to uh, this uh, health care way of getting folks to uh, get money. I think it's disingenuous, dishonest, and unscientific. And so I don't know if I have a good answer, but I don't think it's a, a medical solution. But I, I think that it would be okay to allow people to have some minimal support. I think this is a really good point, because um, if we start thinking it about it in terms of, well, people are in trouble and they need help, and then we give it to them. Poverty, homelessness, people who are domestic violence, survivors, people who are immigrants, and we provide help and support without medicalizing them, without diagnosing them. And we determine who's qualified based not on a medical assessment, but just looking at their lives. And so I think that, you know, we can do that for all the people who are suffering the way that I have been and wasn't able to to work. And maybe it's a trauma framework or whatever kind of framework you want to use. Um, I was suffering. I needed help. And will there be fraud? Will there be people scamming the system? Of course there will. But there's always going to be that. We have to be very careful about it. But reality is that we tend to blame the welfare cheats a lot more than we do the 1% because there's a lot of scamming and fraud going on at the top of the 1% of the pyramid as well. So I don't think that that, that issue should prevent us from providing support. And I think that actually... If if there are people who are relying on disability or who are, you know, resisting going back to work and um, relying on it as, a, as an income support just because of poverty conditions, that says a lot about our economy. And it says a lot about the inequality in our economy. And I think it says a lot about we need to really rethink what's going on and look again at proposals that other countries are, I've started to consider about the guaranteed minimum income. I mean, it's a basic human right to have a certain standard decency of living. And I think that we can provide that to everyone without saying, unless you scam your way onto disability, you're just going to fall to the very bottom and you're not going to have that support. So I think it's a social issue, not a medical issue or biological issue. The proper way to handle this is that if a society decides that it cares about its citizens and cares about all of its citizens, and we are wealthy enough to provide, uh, I believe, a minimum income for all. But in terms of helping people, people who are feeling uh, you know, out of control, the last thing I would want to do is medicalize it uh, because these are, these are on many levels understandable as normal efforts to cope, perhaps not very well. And the more we can normalize the process, the more we can help. And I think some economic support for people who are unable for some period of time to manage their lives, uh, I don't see this as uh, anything that is undoable. One of the dilemmas that I think happens is that people will claim, look, I have this medical illness. It's not my fault. I don't have control over it. It's something that happened to me because in our society, that's how you get compassion. If you are struggling with something that's more ambiguous or maybe less clear, people just say, oh, you're lazy, that's your problem. But then if you can say, well, actually, no, I have a physical problem, I have a biological problem, it's not my fault, then you gain compassion and understanding. And I've seen this with some of the educational work around the police, because if the police encounter someone misbehaving or not responding or doing something weird or disruptive in, in public, and then they just say, wow, this guy's a criminal, I'm going to go after him. But then the argument comes, well, no, no, wait, don't treat them like a criminal. It's mental illness. It's not their fault. You have to be compassionate because it's an illness just like any other. And, and then, sadly, that is what motivates the change of perspective to be more understanding. Oh, this isn't your fault. It's an illness. It's just you just are suffering from this thing that's not under your control. Therefore, now we're going to extend you compassion. But the question to me is, why can't we just extend compassion to everyone to begin with? Why do we need that frame of mind that I think Americans often get into of blaming people and saying that you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You are your own worst enemy. You are the problem inside of yourself. We have a very judgmental culture, and then we've brought in this medical thing as a way of leveraging against that harshness and that meanness that I think we wouldn't give people compassion otherwise. Being sick, being in the sick role, is by definition a, uh, an excusatory role. When you're sick, 
you're properly not supposed to be responsible for certain things. By making it a comprehensive way to look at madness, that it's a medical problem, you have created this opportunity both for excusatory behavior and manipulative behavior. And that complicates everything. You know, because some people may feel out of control. Some people may want control and will act in a certain way in order to get certain things. You see, so... And people have been trained into seeing themselves as out of control because they get benefits. They, they get a certain kind of compassion or response. And then the delicate balance of, well, there's things that aren't in your control, but maybe there are things that are in your control. That's where I think this educational process of therapy and support and help can, can come in. And much more helpfully, if not labeled a medical problem, because medical problem is like, I can't do anything about that. Tommy, one of the dilemmas that comes into this discussion is, is the issue of suicide and suicidal feelings. If someone is talking and behaving in a way that people get worried about them committing suicide, then that's when a medicalization comes in. You have a, the symptom of a disease or disorder. Your brain is trying to kill you. I hear people say this. And then that's when the coercion comes in, and it's, it's done in the name of protecting the person. Well, we really need to put you in a safe place you don't seem like you can really go voluntarily so. Sorry, you're a suicide risk. We've assessed you. We've decided that you're a danger to yourself, and we're going to put you in this safe place, this locked hospital ward, which actually turns out to not be safe because it's very traumatizing often for a lot of people to be in locked wards. But this, I think, is the dilemma that I think we're, we're dealing with. What are your thoughts about that? The research is clear. We cannot predict when a person will kill themselves or if they will kill themselves, even if they are at the so-called highest risk group, if they're in that highest risk group. So that's the reality. In other words, locking someone up, although you'll hear these anecdotal stories, and I've had discussions with people who say, well, you know, I saved someone's life. Well, my only response is, but show me one study that has demonstrated that any group of individuals has been saved from suicide as a result of the involuntary hospitalization. As far as we have data, that is not possible. There's another issue. You cannot sit in front of a person and with any degree of accuracy be predictive. I cannot, talking to you, do an assessment of an individual, and this is the case about other behaviors uh, as well, sexual abuse, physical abuse, all violence, all those. There's no accurate way to predict that. So individual assessments are not scientifically valid. Uh, although we use them for bureaucratic and administrative reasons, uh, but I think these things should be reconsidered because they do not really do what they're supposed to. So what is your sense of the culture of suicide risk assessment and um, involuntarily hospitalizing people among professionals? Human beings would like to think that tomorrow is going to be the same as today. I will be safe. Uh, you know, I won't have anything happen to me that is unexpected. Uh, I want stability. And so that's, I think, our psychological need. The reality, unfortunately, is that the world is uh, very, very unstable, unpredictable. So this is a tough thing for human beings to get themselves around. The idea of self-murder is related to, uh, especially in America, an enormous inability to deal with death and aging. Social workers, for example, are expected under certain circumstances to report uh, what they call suicidal ideations. That's suicidal thinking or descriptions of plans and that sort of thing. And in order to not lose your license, you have to follow those steps. Otherwise, you risk uh, your entire professional welfare. On the other hand, you, by doing that, you perhaps eliminate an important engagement with a client who is seeking some uh, real, real solace and support and help with a deeply, deeply disturbing set of beliefs and feelings and, you know, so, sort of experiences. Well, that professional view ends up denying the person of a place to go to speak openly about their experience and also, I think, pushes people away from getting help because they're afraid of the consequences if they reveal suicidal feelings. And I think... In fact, it's a teeny, tiny percentage of people 
who commit suicide and our focus on it is out of proportion to its actual empirical impact. Yeah, the number of people who have suicidal feelings is, is much, much higher than people who actually end up killing themselves. I mean, think about having homicidal feelings. Think about the fantasies of wanting to kill somebody else. And then the number of people who carry that out is very, very small. So we've confused these two things in a very unfortunate way. But I think it helps maintain psychiatric practice. What has been missing in the uh, discussion, the broad discussion nationally, is the voice of good scientists who are critical of the mainstream framework of psychiatry. I think that that is changing somewhat, but there is a lot of misinformation even about the science of mainstream psychiatry. You know, the issue of chemical imbalance, a totally false claim about depression, you know, is just starting to seep out. There's a lot of mainstream research that no good researcher argues chemical imbalance. But it is often what most lay people think about what causes depression. What about the holistic practitioners who will say, well, you know, you're depressed, so let's take a look at your vitamin D deficiency. I mean, I, I take supplements. I know that my nutrition is really important for my well-being and my mental health. But that's really different. That's not what we're talking about in terms of what's causing schizophrenia or causing depression. We have to eliminate the idea that there are such things as schizophrenia. Almost no one these days simply accepts that the DSM diagnostic categories are correct. I, I mean, if Insul, Tom Insul uh, admits it, you know that there's a deep problem. Again, these categories have been around for a hundred years now. So that is, of course, something that is culturally going to be an effort to change. But we have to begin, change the discussion about troubling behavior, problematic behavior, use that language. How we talk about issues influences how we think about them. We have a ways to go. Tommy, we're just about out of time. Tell people how they can get in touch with you if they want to reach you, and also remind us about your, your new book that just came out. Uh, much of what I've discussed is in uh, this book that my colleagues and I wrote this year, published this year by uh, transaction publishers. Uh, it's called Math Science, Psychiatric Coercion, Diagnosis, and Drugs. If you would like to get in touch with me at the College of Social Work at Florida State University, my email is t like in Thomas, g o m o r y at f s u dot e d u. Tommy Gamori, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. And thanks so much, Will, for giving me the opportunity to have this conversation with you. You've been listening to an interview with Tommy Gamori. He's an associate professor at the College of Social Work at Florida State University. He teaches and researches on mental health and homelessness. His recent book is Mad Science, Psychiatric Coercion, Diagnosis, and Drugs, co-authored with Stuart Kirk and David Cohen. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> You've been listening to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, Portland Hearing Voices, and Freedom Center. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall and producer is Leah Harris. Madness Radio is based at KBOO in Oregon and can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network. Contact us at radio at madnessradio.net. <laughs>